Welcome to um, this um, afternoon event in the city of Washington uh, on the future of internet freedom. Um, we have um, over 300 people that have registered for this event from 36 countries. And for those of you who are calling in from all over the globe, uh, we appreciate um, you being with us um, in uh, a very inconvenient time zone, and we hope that uh, the time that you spend with us is uh, worthwhile today. Um, my name is um, Eric Novotny, and I um, am a professor at American University, as well as a faculty fellow of the Internet Governance Laboratory. We are pleased to have as co-sponsors uh, the IGL and the School of Communication, uh, at American University, as well as the School of International Service, which is my home, um, as well as the Voices of Internet Freedom Coalition and the Internet Society's uh, Greater Washington Chapter. Please keep in mind that this is a webinar format and you will be able to submit questions and comments that um, we will then in turn, um, all the panelists will be able to see them and we'll try to respond to them as uh, quickly as we, um, as we can. This is a public event. Um, it is being uh, recorded, um, as I said. And um, in looking over the um, attendees, it was quite clear that we have uh, many members of the uh, internet community who have done um, work in the internet freedom space for quite some time as well as some uh, individuals that may be here to learn as well as to contribute. And so I, I just wanna say when we get into the Q&A, uh, we wanna keep this as informal and conversational as possible. And um, for those of you who wanna ask fundamental questions, that's fine. If we want experts to weigh in and give their perspectives, that's fine too. So let me begin by uh, introducing my co-host, Arm Sinrak, uh, who is, the, uh, who is um, uh, with the um, uh, American University School of Communication and is a professor there and is a uh, longtime um, uh, advocate of internet freedom as well as a musician. I guess, Aram, you didn't bring your bass fiddle with you today, is that right? It's uh, two floors below me. Oh, okay. So um, maybe next time you can serenade us um, uh, during the event, but we've got a lot to cover and we don't have a lot of time um, to, uh, uh, to do it. Um, I would also uh, just mention uh, initially that Maziar Bahari, who had planned to join us from his office in London, uh, has had a personal conflict and will not be able to um, uh, join us today. So, um, in our first panel, we wanted to uh, set the stage for the demand for internet freedom, the demand side of internet freedom. And it seems to me today that we have um, uh, an inflection point. Um, we have threats to democratic governance around the world. We have increasing technological sophistication of adversaries that want to block uh, a free and, and flat and open internet. Uh, we have problems of delivering um, uh, internet access at scale, and we have changes in the governance of the internet itself, such as fragmentation. So here to discuss um, and tell their stories about um, internet freedom and the obstacles to it, uh, we have uh, Xiao Chang, uh, Franak Viacorka, and Tim uh, Resevere. Xiao um, is a professor at uh, University of California, Berkeley, and a well-known figure in the human rights um, um, aspects of um, China. Uh, Franak Viacorka, who is the director of the Digital Communications Network, and we'll talk about the situation in Belarus, and Tim Receiver from the Peace Tech Lab. So for our opening uh, remarks to set the stage and to um, establish the conversation, I'd like to ask Aram to give us a couple of minutes of opening remarks, and then I'll turn the program over to uh, Xiao, ask him a couple of questions. So Aram. Thanks, Eric. Uh, so I think, you know, I'd love to give a whole history of internet freedom dating back to John Perry Barlow's Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace in 1996 
And through the uh, web 2.0 era, where suddenly people realized that the internet could affect the real world. Um, my favorite moment during that time was when students organized a walkout in California in 2006 using MySpace. But let's just focus on the last decade, the post-Arab Spring decade of internet freedom. There are a couple things that Eric has already named that have really changed in that era. One is that governments and activists have gotten a lot savvier uh, about using the internet to organize uh, and prevent the organization of political events offline. Uh, from China uh, instituting DPAC inspection over the internet in 2012 to its current social credit system, uh, it's gotten more and more of a stranglehold over internet communications. But at the same time, we've seen increasing uh, public awareness that the internet is a crucial platform for democracy. And we saw again early in the decade, you know, the SOPA and PIPA protests in, in the United States, the ACTA protests in, uh, in the European Union, and the sense that people could no longer kind of sit back and assume that the internet was being taken care of, or that the internet was a kind of natively democratic place or, or a separate place from the political reality. I think another important trend we've seen over the past decade has been the increasing toxicity of online cultures. What my soon to be colleague, uh, Adrian Masanari uh, has called uh, um, um, masculine techno cultures or toxic masculine techno cultures. Um, and that toxicity has, has really uh, almost in many ways come to define internet culture in apposition uh, to the way that we used to think about it as this kind of free flowing, you know, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog, uh, kind of realm of pure ideas, a pure public sphere that we used to imagine for it in the 1990s and 2000s. Um, you know, now we see, uh, you know, beginning with like Gamergate and through uh, the Trump campaign and the Modi campaign and the Brexit campaign, uh, just a, a really coordinated effort to leverage the kind of uh, inherently toxic aspects of some of these online subcultures to distribute and validate some of the uh, most violent and disinform disinformative political communication we've seen in the modern era. Um, that has not been helped by America's uh, diminishing uh, stature in terms of being seen as a bastion of internet freedom. Uh, back when uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton first introduced the term internet freedom on a world stage a decade ago, uh, you know, America was kind of seen as this, this uh, uh, gold standard of openness and transparency and accountability. Uh, but uh, beginning with the Snowden uh, leaks in 2013 and, and following through some of the changes to uh, American technological and cultural diplomacy in the Trump era, I think there's a lot of mistrust poisoning the international waters. That has been further compounded by the fragmentation of uh, the, uh, the governance of the internet during those years. Um, as probably everybody on this call knows, ICANN got international, internationalized in 2016. Uh, and cease to essentially be uh, controlled by the US government. Um, but we've also seen the BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, um, developing plans to set up their own backup DNS root servers and essentially fragmenting uh, that level of the stack. Uh, we've seen um, data privacy laws emerging from Brazil to the EU uh, over the last uh, three or four years that have included clauses uh, that are sometimes referred to as data sovereignty essentially requiring information not to be passed over international conduits and especially not through servers controlled by the United States, uh, which further fragments uh, the, the possibility for internet freedom and the free flow of information online. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned before, um, we see larger nations like China and, and Russia and India uh, really beginning to break off uh, from, uh, from the global internet, uh, not just at the infrastructural level, but in terms of uh, in terms of, of the surveillance dimensions of it, in terms of the censorship dimensions of it, um, so in 2020, you know, if you'd asked me 10 years ago when I was doing my work on on what I called MondoNet and mesh networks, I would have said it was very easy to define internet freedom. In fact, we came up, my co-authors and I. Uh, came up with a list of what we called 10 social specifications. And basically our argument was technologically deterministic. It was, you know, as long as your technology conforms to these things, uh, everything will be Jake. And I'd say 10 years later, I don't feel that confident and I don't feel that, uh, that, that um, 
that clear in my vision of what internet freedom means. I think it's actually difficult to define internet freedom in this age. Uh, freedom from uh, freedom from harassment, freedom from surveillance, freedom from disinformation, or is it freedom to freedom to express yourself, freedom to uh, have privacy in your daily lives, freedom of commerce and freedom of markets. Um, these are all definitions of internet freedom that are very common in the public debate and in the governance world these days. And they're um, in many ways mutually incompatible. To develop one freedom uh, is to diminish another. Um, and, and you know we've seen that even in the, in the little echo chambers of the alt-right. There was an article out just a day or two ago uh, about how Parler, uh, the ultra right-wing uh, alternate uh, social media platform for people who have been deplatformed from Facebook and Twitter for being too hateful, um, you know, is now a, a, a wash in pornographic spam because their fundamental lack of moderation uh, and automated controls over content on the platform uh, have led to this kind of hypertrophy of toxicity that not even the toxic voices on the internet can cope with. Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, increasingly also in the, in the post-US ICANN era, we're seeing a real kind of move towards recognizing the role of the global south in trying to set its own terms for engagement in these international communications networks and markets. So just to wrap it up, I think Eric is absolutely right. We are on the cusp of a new era of internet freedom. And it's not just that uh, it's impossible to define at this point that we have these, this fractured internet and this multi-stakeholder international uh, set of, uh, of governance protocols, but we also have emerging threats like quantum decryption which is going to render a lot of end-to-end -end encrypted communications irrelevant, or at least uh, more visible to surveillers. Um, we have huge looming issues around artificial intelligence and the ethics of using AI, and when and whether and to what extent we should produce a manipulated media like deepfakes. Um, that also kind of plays into the question of post-human rights. And of course, my colleague, Laura Dinardis, uh, who's the, the current dean of our school, just published a great book earlier this year called The Internet and Everything, in which she accurately points out that the internet is no longer really a communications medium or a public sphere. It is a control system for virtually every social institution. And there was actually a, a story that just broke today about how hackers are maliciously targeting the chain that's supposed to keep COVID vaccines frozen until they reach their intended targets, um, and how that chain of provenance is essentially vulnerable uh, to hacking because it's all online. So I think we can't talk about internet freedom unless we take into account the amount of complexity that's been introduced into the system over the past 10 years, and some of these looming threats that we face in the coming 10 years. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Aram. Um, Hard to believe we would long for the good old days of bulletin boards and IRC channels, but uh, I guess that's where we're at. So, you know, thank you for setting the stage. And one of the reasons we wanted to hold this event and we hope some subsequent events in the future um, is to get these issues out on the table. For those of us who have spent the last decade or more working in internet freedom, it seems that the challenges and opportunities are greater than they have ever been before. Um, um, I'd, li I'd like to um, ask um, uh, Xiao uh, Chang about um, the current situation in China. You know, we have a good window into what's happening in the West as Aram has explained, but um, there are some fundamental needs um, uh, as well in the Chinese context. And um, I'd like to turn the program over to him for a couple, three minutes and tell us what the situation is like there. Shell? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, just fine, go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry why I, the, my, my Zoom doesn't let me to turn on my video, so that the host is, is stopping me to turn on the video. Uh, oh, now it's okay. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear and see you. All right, great. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. A um, couple of minutes to talk about the demand uh, from the China side. Uh, one fifth of population, second largest economy, 
and the largest internet market in China, internet brought hope for freedom in late 90s in Chinese society. And uh, really some vibrant citizen voices uh, and collaborative uh, actions uh, for civil society during the first decade of the um, 2000, until 2012, 13, when President Xi Jinping came in, fully realized the danger. He actually said something like, uh, internet is my biggest worry. Yeah. Uh, he said something like, Chinese Communist Party can win the civil war, can fight. Chinese Communist Party can run economy because look our economic growth. But I'm not sure Chinese Communist Party can survive in the information age. That's the challenge. Uh, that was about six years ago. Now, looking at the China's internet and cyberspace, I think the American scholar who my previous speaker was right. Chinese government successfully turned the internet cyberspace into a control space rather than a free flow of information space. Chinese government actually managed to censor, manipulate, control, surveil, blocking, filtering, everything you name it, and the more. Uh, AI, big data, um, facial recognition, voice recognition, uh, deep fake. Together, suppressed the free uh, expression and, and the freedom in the Chinese society. What is the internet freedom in Chinese society does need to redefine much greater challenge, but much greater need too, right? Chinese people are still human beings, want to express themselves and want those freedom. Uh, but uh, uh, right now, it is certainly a new era. I'll just stop here and answer questions. Okay, very good, Xiao, thank you. What? Um... Just as a, as a follow-up before we go to our next speaker, um, uh, where do you see this uh, headed in the um, competition between uh, the United States and China, and especially with the new uh, American um, government uh, administration coming in very shortly, uh, do you think that um, uh, the uh, policies of the Chinese government will change in any significant way? I don't think the Chinese government policy will change in any way. Uh, I see China as well on its way to developing further the digital technology uh, uh, into the control apparatus, right? If you want to call it surveillance state apparatus, you know, on, on top of ideological state apparatus and the repressive state apparatus such as police and military. This is a whole new level of the uh, state controlled or state to have access to, including all the China's private businesses, internet businesses, whether Tengxun, Alibaba, uh, you know, the, 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 the Weibo, anything you name it, that their data, users data can be stored and accessed by the state, even being used uh, for some social credit system or other potential yeah, manipulative systems that state control the individuals. So we're really, what we're really seeing is China is on its way heading to a digital totalitarianism state. And that the, Chin, the, the new uh, American administration must recognize that's the continued path. Just like the, the, the current Trump administration has recognized that uh, uh, China is a strategic competitor and threat to the United States. The Biden administration should continue to confirm that recognition and come out effective strategy to counter it because it's not just China becoming a totalitarian state. It's that global expansion of that digital totalitarian technology and influence is the US needs to counter. Xiao, do you mind if I just follow up very quickly on one point that you made? Sure. Uh, I think this term that you're using, digital totalitarian state, is, uh, is a very important concept. And I wonder if you could unpack it just a little bit for us. Is the, is the use of the word digital in that, in that term, does that suggest that all of these other um, institutions of control are now um, subservient to or somehow linked in to the, the digital? Has the digital platform become the paramount platform of, total, of totalitarian control? 
it's on its way. Uh, no, China is far from there yet. China was a totalitarian state under Mao, and then sort of post that uh, totalitarian state o o over the last 30, 40 years. But what do I mean by digital totalitarianism? Coming back to what totalitarianism is, is the state have such overwhelming power to almost every aspect of individuals' life, right? Private uh, spheres, your social life, your financial transactions, your mobility of you know, taking a taxi, your staying in a hotel. But look, everything today in China, these are digital apps. And there are actually one or two or few digital apps, like WeChat, almost cover everything. And those companies, those data, and those apps are in the state hands. So in the not a very far future, even sometimes in currently, like how the China's trace, uh, uh, tracking trace, uh, uh, trace contact of the coronavirus, they already mobilized the telephone companies, the, the social media companies and get their data, trace down to people where they are, who they interact with very effectively. So state already have that ability and have the intent and the technology intent, they're, they're outlining the, the picture, that's where China is going, including the social credit system. That If that keep on going like that, uh, yes, every aspect of individual's life will be in state hand, not only for punishment, they can not you, they can motivate you, they even can read your unconscious in a sense, and mobilize the crowd to do things the state wants to do. But to me, that is a definition of a digital totalitarianism. Great, thanks so much. Um, we also um, hear a lot about the plight of journalists in countries around the world and about the use and abuse of the internet in the electoral process. Um, and so I'd like to um, invite uh, Franak to uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, what has happened and what is happening in Belarus. Uh, Franak, as you know, I introduced him as head of the um, Digital Communications Network and also an alumnus of American University. So Franek, um, please um, give us your views. Uh, sure, can I, can I, can you start my video? Yes, yes. Um, uh, good evening uh, of Lithuania time, good afternoon of uh, DC time. Um, first of all, thank you. Thank you, professor, for inviting me. Uh, yes, I graduated two years ago. Uh, from American University, and that was uh, the most beautiful time. And after that, I came back to uh, to Belarus. And what I was doing, I was trying to transform um, media, traditional media, into uh, into something uh, more efficient, modern, innovative. I was working with Radio Free Europe, Voice of America. I, I worked with the U.S. Agency for Global Media for a while. And um, you know, last uh, months. I am deeply involved in the uh, campaign, in the social campaign for changes in Belarus. Um, I realized uh, that uh, uh, I, I cannot stay aside, and I have to use my media knowledge and technology knowledge to uh, to empower to empower voices that were not heard. And um, um, to provide, to give you example of Belarus, uh, Belarus is the authoritarian country which is uh, moving quickly to totalitarianism with no uh, free internet more than 70 websites are blocked um, now during the protests every sunday every monday internet is shut down um, mobile internet is not accessible um, uh, your correspondence through major messengers and uh, your emails can be checked perhaps it's not so bad as in china yet but uh, but still, uh, the, the level of the internet censorship is, is extremely high. And um, what, what we saw, we saw that during last um, one or two years, uh, the whole civil society moved to the messaging app Telegram. So basically, when the traditional internet got um, limited or shut down, people began looking for the new places where they can uh, talk freely, discuss politics, etc. And uh, Telegram messaging app, uh, two years ago, not very known in Belarus, now uh, is, has, has the audience more than 60% of Belarusians. And thanks to Telegram, uh, people got access to the information. 
people got access to the um, uh, independent news outlets. And, for, and, and most importantly, they began creating their own outlets. So basically the, the appearance and emerging technology um, helped uh, Belarusians to, to become journalists themselves, not professional, but, um, uh, but, but uh, still being on the ground and seeing on the, with their own eyes what is happening uh, in the field. And uh, this year, thanks to Telegram uh, messaging app and thanks to some other apps which were not blocked by authorities, including TikTok, Chinese TikTok, which was not blocked, uh, by the way, uh, people uh, started spreading information, news about the situation in the country. Uh, Lukashenko was brutally uh, cracking down the protesters. Many people got tortured and beaten. And uh, only thanks to the citizen journalism empowered by uh, Telegram messaging app, where everyone can, uh, can create their own channels and securely share information and content, uh, uh, this, this led, this sparked the revolution, the uprising. And um, we can see right now that all the groups, all the protests uh, in different cities of Belarus are coordinated with um, uh, encrypted messengers. Me messengers. Uh, first of all, Telegram, but also Signal. Uh, and, uh, and Telegram and Signal uh, helped uh, many activists who were not uh, able to communicate freely before uh, to, to create local communities. Uh, all these lives from local chats, local communities on Telegram, it moved to offline world. Uh, people created their own groups, teams, communities on Telegram with, uh, with their neighbors. And they talked what they can do together. And we saw something extremely unique for Belarus. Uh, the protest not organized centrally by the opposition, but protest organized by uh, local communities, by neighbors or residents of one a residential block, let's say. It's a really authentic uh, grassroots civil society empowered by uh, technology, which seems to be very simple, but thanks to the security and thanks to its simplicity, which became the, the uh, magic bullet. Uh, and uh, Lukashenko, the dictator of Belarus, who is in power for 26 years, uh, surely he's trying to limit uh, this, this technology, uh, but thanks to the connection to the owner of the app. We are basically in touch with, uh, with owner and the founders and manager of Telegram. They inbuilt uh, dynamic VPNs and dynamic circumvention tools that allowed us to, to have access to the app in the time when internet shut down. And the second tool is Siphon, which will be also, I think representative will be speaking today as well. Uh, Siphon is another tool which helped millions of Belarusians to, uh, to get access to the independent information during the most brutal uh, time when internet and major websites were blocked. Uh, I will stop here, I see Professor watching me. No, th thanks very much, Franak. Um, we'll come back to that, um, but it's an amazing story and you know, we uh, really admire uh, your courage and uh, you know, your ability to get out the truth uh, and to keep the uh, fires of um, reform and democratic governance um, alive in Belarus. Um, we have about five minutes left uh, before we go to a general Q&A, and I'd like to reserve our last 15 or 20 minutes or so to get some feedback, comments, and questions from the audience. But before we do that, I'd like to ask uh, Tim uh, to give us some views about uh, some of the other countries in the world and um, uh, places and issues that perhaps we haven't talked about and to give us his uh, perspective on where we stand. Yeah, thank you, Eric. I really appreciate you having me. Um, my name is Tim Receiver and I'm with Peace Tech Lab. And we are a nonprofit in DC that works on media, data and tech to prevent violent conflict around the world. And we started at the US Institute of Peace, so right down the road from American University. And um, I'll just give you, one year ago, we were, um, we got a call from Vint Cerf, who uh, developed TCPIP as one of the fathers of the internet. And he called us to, to ask if we would be interested in talking to Nizar Zaka, who's an internet freedom advocate, who had just recently got out of Iran prison. Um, he was in prison in Iran for four years. 
And we, we hired him last year and we have a larger focus on internet freedom going forward. So this, this really fits with you know, what, where we wanna be. Um, we work a lot on the last mile problem and engaging with end users on, on different tools. Um, one of the projects we work on is hate speech lexicons on identifying hate speech in different countries. Um, the project I was heading for the longest time and, and still do is, is called Peace Tech Exchanges, which is uh, where we take low cost off the shelf uh, technology tools, media tools, data tools, and we take those into individual countries. So they could be 2G tools in Niger, they could be working on machine learning in North Macedonia, for instance. And, and these are all, everyone has a focus on the challenges of peace building. So corruption and governance issues and and just general violence in some places. And the tools we're taking in are, are social media and survey tools and mapping data analytics, uh, podcasting and, and those kind of things. Our, our very first workshop was in Iraq and we were focused on anti-corruption. And one of the things that got flagged for us early on was that the government officials were in the room taking notes on who was in the, the trainings and what they were talking about. And we, we had one of our, our um, this, this trusted NGO that we had in Iraq, he came to us and, and said that they have a, really a kind of a gap in the knowledge of what tools are out there that they can use as far as is um, getting around the censorship, uh, digital security tools. And so we had our, late, our, our first late night uh, um, training with, with this, um, this group of NGOs in Iraq um, without the government officials there um, around digital security and internet freedom tools. And, and this is now part of of every workshop that we do around the world and the dozens that we've, we've worked on. And some of the tools are exactly what, um, you know, have already been mentioned, the, the signals, the telegram, the WhatsApp, tours, the free gate, ultra search, um, those kind of tools. And, um, you know, last year we were in Central Asia. We've, we've been in Azerbaijan the, the last couple of years and we see very similar issues going on in those countries as well. Um, I would say also that, um, we, we were in um, Niger and, and as, as far as access goes, you know, we, we spent a lot of time in West Africa and Nigeria and Niger and, and we were seeing that, you know, there's more, probably more mobile phones there than, than electricity in a lot of places. And, and people really want the, you know, they value those, those cell phones over uh, some of the other amenities that, that they could go for and, and, and paying for those as well. And we see a lot of possibilities with the internet access. Um, we've got an office in Kenya and we see something like M-Pesa and you know, mobile money that, that goes on. We see that being applied in Afghanistan to cut down on corruption in pay to police officers, for instance. Uh, we see, you know, we work on responsive government and service delivery. And with COVID, we see that, that you know, these phones can be a lifeline to education. Um, you know, just economic growth. We were looking at um, if if all of the if all of Africa had the same internet connectivity as as the West, that would generate 140 million more jobs in those places. But you know, looking at Africa, we see you know the telecoms are rising rapidly, and that's super exciting. Uh, but we see the majority is um, Chinese capital investment coming in, and you know we look at places like um, Uganda. We were there last year, and Zambia, and we see that, you know, those telco telcos have been helping the governments um, give them inf information on their political opponents. And, um, you know, the, we were, we, today um, I was in a, a meeting with the Atlantic Council and Dame Wendy Hall said that, you know, in the old days, it, it was a breakdown of privacy versus surveillance. And today she sees it as a, as a, um, civil liberties versus national security is how, the, how she broke it down, which I, I thought was really interesting. And we, you know, we know that national security looks different in different places. And in a case like Uganda, where they were, they were monitoring political opponents, they were using national security as an excuse to, to do that. So um, I know I'm out of time, but uh, in closing, I, I know we can't do a lot about the infrastructure in places like Africa or Central Asia, uh, but we can ensure that people you know, they know the risk and they have access to some of these tools that are either free or, or very inexpensive. So thank you, Eric. Great, thanks very much, Tim. Um, it, it's interesting uh, when you bring up the examples, particularly in, in countries where uh, mobile money is very popular. 
um, you know, one would hope that the traditional arguments of collateral freedom would hold up, you know, where governments would uh, simply uh, not be able to um, engage in major disruptions or, or shutdowns of, of the internet in order to keep the, their economies going. But, you know, there may be also, uh, and as we know, some important exceptions to that. Um, I'd like to now, we have a, a number of questions coming in and we're really grateful for those. We have a number of questions on, on China, um, but I'd like to first circle back to Franak um, a bit. Um, we have a question um, about um, people in Belarus, um, are they threatened with legal consequences if they use a circumvention tool? You know, or if they use um, uh, a, a, a tool that helps them overcome uh, the filtering and blocking. Uh, I, I I don't know the cases when people were punished for using uh, VPNs or anonymizers or siphon or any other tools on their phones, uh, but I think it, we are going there. Uh, every time someone is being detained, uh, the first thing they are checking they are checking your photos, your phones your contacts list, of course. Um, but people are afraid of safety of their correspondence for sure. And this is why uh, they use traditional old good method to clean all your messages, all your correspondence, all, all your uh, archives after your session, after you got out of your, of your uh, chat. And, um, uh, but also it creates very good uh, culture of safety. Uh, uh, this environment like Belarus, it, it forces people to be very, very um, attentive and careful about this. So people use time, time, um, deadly, how to say this, times, time for, for messaging, how to delete in messages after like 30 or 60 seconds. So it's a good tradition. Also, they are very good in, in terms of setting um, uh, passwords and uh, dual verifications using authenticators, additional authenticators tools. And, uh, but, but regarding uh, circumvention themselves, I think uh, Siphon is the best one. And so far, I don't think uh, someone was punished for having uh, Siphon on their phones or, or, or browsing with, with Siphon. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so so as Eric mentioned, we've had a lot of questions in the Q&A about China. Um, so just to boil them down, maybe we can uh, start with Zhao, but I'd be interested to hear from the other panelists as well. Um, the questions really come in, in two different categories. One is about uh, the perception of the internet among Chinese users and citizens. And the other is about the international effects of China's uh, censorship and surveillance systems. So let's start with the first half, which is what, how do we, uh, those of us who live in the West hear a lot about the, the Great Firewall and about uh, Chinese uh, internet surveillance and censorship, but how do actual Chinese nationals perceive these, these efforts on behalf of the government? Do they view them as, uh, their, is, is it their civic responsibility to, to, um, to stay in line or do they view it as, a, as an incursion on their rights or how does that break down? Who are the different factions and, and how does resistance emerge? Uh, talking about acceptance of, uh, sort of internet uh, uh, technology in Chinese society is great. China has very, very large uh, penetrations of society, right? Uh, I actually don't even have the most updated number, what, 800 million mobile phones, smartphones, um, and uh, uh, the uh, anybody who visit the China or, or even just look at the news, you know how ubiquitous uh, the digital apps are all over the places. Uh, the top seven largest internet companies, right, other than Google, Apple, Amazon, and three out of seven are Chinese companies. Let's say Alibaba, Tengxun, and yeah, Baidu. Um, and there's many other Chinese technology giants are coming up. In terms of political freedom, that pe whether people uh, uh, accept uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, censorship, particularly Great Firewall, the short answer is no. 
uh, uh, starting from the beginning, right? The Great Firewall uh, was, uh, you know, the, the one in charge of Great Firewall is a comp computer scientist who was a uh, uh, um, sort of became a symbol of of, of the Great Firewall because he's an engineering, but he's he works for for the state and he basically architect of the whole Great Firewall and he was very public about it, and he was being thrown at a shoe. Uh, uh, by uh, at one of his lectures, and when he showed up on the Chinese social media, there were the ten thousands of curse under his uh, WeChat that the censor has to close down because he's, everybody hated him so much because because of him or because he symbolized that effort that the Chinese internet user cannot access to Google, cannot access to you know YouTube, whatsoever, uh, everything else that, that they they also want to access to. Um, that being said. When the Great Firewall actually started there, uh, not only stopped the, many of the filtering and many of those informations flow, but also making the uh, internet environment, competitive environment very different from uh, the, for Chinese business and US business and uh, everybody else, right? Those largest US uh, internet companies cannot even go to China. Google is one, uh, uh, Facebook is another, you name it. Um, and the Chinese users has to, yeah, uh, uh, to use all the Chinese apps and, and, and Chinese social media uh, things. And yeah, their, their content will be deleted, they'll be censored, uh, they're suppressed, but uh, they don't have an option. There are, there are desires and demand to, for circumvention tools, VPNs and other things. These are uh, um, in great demand. But government also cracking down on that. They arrest people. They uh, 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 arrest even the circumvention developers. Um, in the latest case, in the last few uh, last year or so, even the individuals, unlike Belarus, if individuals using circumvention tools now uh, uh, can be vastly still not. But there's increasing cases, not individually, hundreds of cases that police somehow can find out they have that app. And then they ask them to, um, they find them, or they ask them to uh, um, write a sort of guarantee form the, uh, to say that I never use that again. And they publish their names in uh, Zhejiang province on, on the police website, uh, dozens of those cases. So I, I, the, in China, there are still millions of people still using VPN and other circumvention softwares uh, 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 that, um, you know, to, to uh, um, access to the greater internet. Uh, but it's getting increasingly more and more difficult. Even more so, the Chinese government actually come out since the VPN becoming a thing, the Chinese government come out its own state-sponsored VPNs, which let people to use that to get on Google or, or, or Facebook, but still filtered, pre-filtered out within that so-called VPN services, some uh, 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 the websites they don't like, such as my own uh, uh, organization, China Digital Times, et cetera. Uh, um, and Voice America is another one, and you can name it, there's a whole bunch of free, free, uh, Radio Free Asia. Um, so that's one side of, of, the, of the story. But on the surveillance side of it, that's actually a greater challenge, which is somehow in Chinese society, the acceptance of technology also come with the people lack of awareness of privacy and lack of a protection of privacy data, which causing that um, the surveillance, both for company, private companies and the state, much easier to get hold of individual data in a massive scale. Uh, and then based on that, developed all kind of uh, sort of, you know, trained the artificial uh, intelligence programs, the, 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 that deep learning programs becoming apps in many, many aspects in life. So yeah, many of them create a great convenience, uh, but same time, uh, 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 the uh, data protection um, privacy side, uh, I don't see a strong push in the Chinese society currently, even there are only some voices, but not a strong demand. Okay, thank you. Uh, very powerful comments indeed. Uh, we've got a number of questions here concerning the overall governance uh, picture and uh, how these controversies in information control um, affect the governance structures, um, whether uh, there are United Nations structures that could um, possibly uh, be invoked or, um, uh, or expanded. 
Uh, there are some questions about whether the Chinese model of internet governance will um, um, uh, perhaps overtake the multi-stakeholder model or other models of internet governance that we've become uh, used to. Um, and then, of course, um, it's always this uh, slippery slope. Um, if you begin trying to defend yourself against what appears to be propaganda or disinformation, does that invite abuse in and of itself? Uh, and on the other hand, if you allow the free flow of information, do you uh, then become susceptible in a greater way to disinformation and, and, and propaganda, or perhaps even exacerbate conflicts in certain countries? And so um, I'd like to hear from Tim um, on, uh, I guess you deal with this and you have to wrestle with it every day, Tim. Um, uh, what are some of these issues and uh, where do you think this is headed? Yeah, oh, that's a good question. It's, um, you know, for, when we look at the free flow of information and we, we know that those, you know, that free flow can lead to, to violence. Um, there's a few things that, that we're doing right now. Um, one is we're, we're looking at, you know, we, we we obviously, it's kind of what Aram said earlier, it's like freedom to, uh, freedom from, you know, we kind of see both of those sides, um, but freedom to people want to express themselves. Um, in, in this case, we, we look at individual countries and, and keywords, phrases, networks that are, that are spreading hate speech in those areas and, and trying to get ahead of those um, and you know, we look at social media that um, you know, a community moderator, for instance, on, on Facebook in, in West Africa, they're, they're not gonna have the ability to fact check everything coming in. So we, you know, we can look for debunked information, say around COVID, and we could put those phrases into searches that you know, automatically tag things that are coming in and flagging that for moderators, for instance, where they can, they can um, flag that, they can take it down uh, quicker than, than just doing it manually. So that's just, just one example of, of ways that we're looking at this. Um, another one, like with, with our hate speech lexicons, this is um, a project that we worked on with uh, Facebook to identify keywords and phrases in, in these countries. And now we're looking at, you know, with, with Google, right now they are static. So they are, it's, a, it's a lexicon that we can pass off to researchers. Um, but we want to be able to, to put that, automate those words and see kind of how they evolve over time and how the networks that are spreading um, hate speech, for instance, are, are evolving over time. So just, uh, just one sample. Yeah, very good, thank you. Um, we've got uh, time for uh, one more set of questions and then I'll ask uh, Aram to sum up and then we'll, we'll talk about the tech side um, uh, of this issue. Um, I had a couple of questions, uh, Frana, about some of the um, foreign companies like A1 Telecom Austria, Sandvine, um, and other um, uh, foreign um, companies that may have contributed to um, the technologies that have engaged in either surveillance or in uh, deep packet inspection. Uh, yeah, I'll try. Yeah, I'll try to answer this. Um, all the technologies are dual use, and um, especially in dictatorial regimes, uh, uh, the, the authorities, the government are uh, always efficient in adopting all these tools to, uh, to control, to censor, to trace uh, the enemies. Um, regarding uh, A1 Telecom, this is the Austrian uh, company, uh, the telecommunication provider and the biggest uh, telecommunication provider in Belarus. And uh, authorities of Belarus, when they needed to block the internet, they didn't do it with their own hands, but they ordered the foreign Austrian company to do it. And uh, there was a huge scandal that Austria, uh, in fact, is blocking the internet from 12 to 5 p.m. each Sunday, and they're still doing this. Um, we were trying to put pressure on, on the company in Vienna and say, guys, you shouldn't do this. You shouldn't help dictator. But they say, we cannot uh, uh, say no uh, since we are limited with laws. And when the government force us to do, we have, to, uh, we have to, to limit internet. And the second company, that's I think Canadian American company, Sandvine. There was another huge scandal. 
uh, this company is uh, blocking the, the internet. It allows the authorities to, um, uh, to, 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 to block this uh, deep, um, inspection, deep, deep inspection protocol um, uh, technology. So um, uh, access to websites, access to the specific content, and in general, the, the access to the internet outside of the country can be switched off by, by local authorities. And Sandvine sold their equipment to Belarus authorities, and this equipment was used to switch off internet in the um, from August 9 to August 12 of uh, the, this year. And uh, after the scandal, after senators of the U.S. Uh, got informed about this, Sandvain said that they are going to cancel all the contracts and they are going to stop supporting uh, the, the uh, their um, uh, contractor in Belarus, who are Belarus government, who is Belarus government. Good, thank you. Um, that, yeah, that's an excellent update. Um, we've got a number of other questions. If we don't get to all of these, um, um, I'm going to ask my panelist friends to follow up um, um, a bit uh, after this event is over. Um, but uh, I'd like to turn the program over um, to Aram just to summarize. Um, our voices of internet freedom and the demand for internet freedom and its challenges. And then we'll move on to our uh, tech uh, panel um, experts. I would also invite um, all, all of the people who have um, spoken up until this point to please stay on with us. And you are free also to um, uh, provide comments for the balance of our time together. Thanks, Eric. Um, I always learn so much from these events and they always feel like we're just beginning to scratch the surface when we reach the end of a, a, a given conversation. Um, and I wish we had had time to address every single question in the Q&A uh, because they are all really important questions that deserve time and attention to be spent. Uh, I'll just summarize with this one point. Um, I think when we talk about internet freedom and when we talk about internet governance, too often we fall into this framework of you know using these pre-existing categories for different modes of governance you know this is a democratic state that's a totalitarian state that's a socialist state um and the reality is that the more people from different regions talk about um efforts to promote internet freedom and, and efforts to limit internet freedom the more similar the techniques sound right so there you know the state-run vpn uh, that Franak was talking about um, is not very different than some of the commercial VPNs that we see in ostensibly free countries that uh, without the knowledge or consent of their end users log all of their internet traffic and then sell it uh, to third parties, including government actors. Um, you know, or if you look at a company like Facebook and what it's been trying to do over the past couple of years in India uh, and other regions with like it's, it's free basics, um, basically, um, self-contained internet on-ramp uh, service, there is a real coordinated effort between both state actors and commercial actors, large international corporations, to, uh, to essentially create a completely surveillant, censorable internet. And all of the internet freedom, the, 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 the ones that are represented by uh, the people we're about to talk to on the next panel, all of the internet freedom apps uh, and platforms are essentially working in, in not only in opposition to this totalitarian state or to that mega corporation, but in resistance to that entire large coordinated hegemony between the two sets of actors who are scratching each other's backs. Uh, and you know the fact that these two forms of power have mutual interests of control that supersede democratic norms and processes in the public interest, I think that's the big takeaway. Right. This is not about East versus West or global North versus global South or democracy versus totalitarianism. This is about the human desire to have a free and open culture and to have autonomy and sovereignty and the, the desire of large and powerful institutions to prevent that from happening because it destabilizes their power. Back to you, Eric. Yeah, well said, Aram, and that's a great lead in for um, uh, the next um, uh, set of problems that we're going to discuss, because in order to realize that vision uh, and to maintain a certain level of Internet freedom in the interest of people who want to freely associate and communicate with one another, 
uh, and have some government authority in the way. Uh, we need technology platforms to do that. And to tell us um, a little bit more about where this part of internet freedom is going, uh, we have Michael Hull, uh, who is the president of Siphon, uh, Bill Shaw, a developer from uh, Freegate, Clint Jen uh, from Ultrasurf, uh, Adam Fiss, the founder of Lantern. And we have um, two other um, representatives from uh, Great Fire, uh, Martin and Charlie, for security reasons, um, their responses may come through the text panel rather than live on Zoom. Um, and of course, uh, for those of us that work in the internet freedom space, we always re uh, respect uh, the um, security of the people that we're trying to help. So let me- Eric, they, they've, sorry to interrupt. They've, they've, they've requested that I read their answers. They're gonna text me their answers over a secure channel and I'm gonna read them. Right, uh, yeah, exactly. Okay, and so we'll, we'll just do it that way, Arm. Um, uh, and so I'd like to start out with um, uh, asking uh, Michael Hull um, about um, how many people in the world use these tools and in particular Siphon, um, how much information goes over uh, networks that are employing uh, circumvention tools? And can you give some insight about the scale and the magnitude and some of the dynamics of what happens um, uh, during uh, periods of political crisis, as well as routine blocking and filtering? Michael? Uh, oh, th thanks very much, Eric. Um, I'll just go. Uh, um, the uh, Thanks very much, and uh, certainly these are great questions regarding uh, Siphon use. Um, uh, you know, we've been making circumvention software for over 13 years, uh, and uh, th this is, um, you know, when it comes right down to it, the questions you're asking are the, the things that are, meet, we, we need to answer every day to ourselves. So, you know, just to quickly get to some, you know, rough blush numbers, uh, we have, uh, Siphon has, uh, you know, in March of uh, 2020 was our peak. We had 21.4 million people on our monthly active users on our network. And, um, and then uh, currently we have uh, about 18 million monthly user active users on our network. Um, and that's, um, you know, spread out all over the globe. Uh, and, uh, in, you know, including places you probably wouldn't expect um, in, in through um, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, and also uh, in South America, uh, through uh, all through Africa, and um, but uh, and and so you know we we push between 750 and 1.5 uh, petabyte uh, 750 terabytes a, uh, a day up to 1.5 petabytes a day of traffic, and I know that number is so massive it's hard to even know what it really means, but in short. Uh, you know, about uh, people that use the Siphon network consume roughly uh, about a gigabyte of traffic um, uh, every month through our, our circumvention network. Uh, if everyone that's got a cell service plan knows how that would reflect in their daily use of a tool. Um, and um, as well, uh, you know, we get um, uh, countries and, and regions uh, where, you know, I think one of the things about Siphon is it's uh, is our capability of taking surges on, and um, you know, in through this year, for example, we had surges in Iraq, Belarus, more, most recently Azerbaijan, Cuba. Um, uh, you know, just the other day in Cuba, we we had a, a surge there. Always a remarkable thing to see from that uh, island, um, and. Uh, th those typically, you know, what, what comes out of the surges is, you know, we, we've learned over the years how to um, have our system automatically scale up to absorb those users. And then uh, always after the fact, we have roughly two or three times the number of uh, ongoing users after those surges. Um, and uh, so, uh, but also, you know, the real, certainly uh, Iran and, uh, uh, and, uh, and China are two critical countries where we have, uh, you know, a great deal of audience in both those places and uh, that kind of thing. Um, is, I think I answered all the questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you did, Mike. Thanks very much. Um, I mean, it's it's really amazing. And if you heard uh, Franak uh, 
uh, a little bit earlier, uh, Siphon played a, a big role in, in, in Belarus. Um, there are also um, other um, uh, uh, anti-censorship tools that uh, we'd like to hear from today. And so I'd like uh, now to, uh, to go to Bill, um, if he could give us um, a little bit more information about um, Freegate and um, what it does and how many people it serves. And then we'll go to Clint, uh, uh, Adam, and then to Martin and Charlie. Hi, Eric. Thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Bill Xia. I'm the CEO of Dynamic Internet Technologies. We have been working on anti-censorship technology for China since 2002. So in 2002, we first released our software, Freegate. And since then, uh, Freegate has been popular in China. And uh, we have, uh, now we have a few uh, million users from China every month. We mostly focus on China due to our foundry strength. And uh, every month we have um, about 700 uh, terabytes delivered to China. Okay, I think I, I answered all the questions. Okay, very good. Thank you, Bill. Um, um, appreciate it. Um, and can we turn now to Clint Jin from uh, Ultrasurf? Ultrasurf has been around for uh, quite a long time. It's got quite a reputation. Can you tell us um, about where uh, things stand, Clint? Thanks, Eric. Um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, I just uh, gave you a really brief uh, update of our current Ultrasurf situation. So. Uh, um, we developed Ultrasurf uh, 18 years ago in 2002 to help China uh, uh, Chinese people to bypass censorship, uh, um, but without um, uh, promotion, uh, just by word of mouth. Uh, Ultrasurf now is one of the become one of the most popular uh, circumvention uh, tools uh, that used by uh, millions of people around the world uh, from over 100 countries. So currently we have about 10 million monthly uh, unique users. Um, so we, so that, tra uh, uh, that translates to, uh, well, we deliver about 4,000 to 5,000 terabytes of content uh, each month to those 10 million users. Um, so that's about 4 million gigabyte of, of content. Um, so all, keep in mind that all these are limited by the the by fund by the uh, server capacity or, or or another word funding. So we've been out of funding for uh, for, for uh, since 2017. So every so we serve this on our own. Um, so uh, we serve about 10 million monthly users from uh, over 100 countries. At the top uh, countries is Iran. So so um, uh, it's about seven million. Uh, so. Uh, according to the internet uh, search, uh, so that's represent about 10, 12% of internet users from Iran are using Ultrasurf to bypass uh, censorship. So most vast majority of them use Ultrasurf to bypass, uh, to, uh, uh, to um, uh, use uh, Telegram so that they could uh, communicate with each other and with the rest of us in the world freely and safely. Um, other top countries are China, Vietnam, and recently we have a huge spike from Azerbaijan. Um, uh, so, so next, next question. Uh, the major limiting factors currently are funding with limited servers and IPs. We simply cannot promote Autoserve. The reason for so many Iran users is that somehow they find out our beta version of Autoserve Android uh, VPN on Google Play Store and became viral uh, during the January of uh, 2000, uh, uh, 2018, uh, where they are on street, uh, and then uh, our traffic from Iran spiked from 80,000 per day to over 2 millions per day. Um, so for unfortunately, or fortunately, China blocked Google Play Store. Otherwise, with 800 million internet users in China, uh, which is 10, 10 times of Iran, there could be tens of millions of China users using Ultrasurf 
um, uh, that could be a disaster for us. There's no way we could afford to serve that at this point. Um, uh, the, the main challenges are still, so we have been fighting daily battles against the most powerful censors, such as China, who dedicate billions of dollars and thousands of top talents trying to block UltraSurf. UltraSurf has been one of their major threats and target. Even with limited or no funding, we have been um, continuously defeating them for the past 18 years and keep UltraSurf um, alive. Uh, now the, and the, uh, now the, the major limiting factor is still funding. So with adequate funding, we could serve tens of millions more users. Uh, if we could afford to serve 10% 10, 10 internet users in China as we do in Japan, uh, sorry, in Iran, uh, that's basically 80 million monthly users. Uh, it re regarding the uh, surge and spikes, so for, mo for almost every major political uh, events, uh, Auto service traffic spikes from that region due to um, due to limited funding. Our servers crashed during those uh, major events. For example, I give you a few examples. So during the uh, uh, Green Revolution, uh, we couldn't serve the demand. So if we had the funding back then, uh, Green Revolution could have uh, had a different result. And more recently, because of the uh, 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 huge spike from Azerbaijan, we have to limit traffic and users. As a result, uh, as a result, our Iran traffic uh, dropped by half in November. Um, so this, uh, this affects the quality of service a lot. So, uh, so for those people who use UltraSurf right now, um, uh, we, we receive a lot of complaints about being too slow. So bear with us. So we will try to improve it with more funding. Yeah, very excellent. Those are, those are excellent points. Um, I know it uh, puts uh, many of the uh, 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 tech platforms in a very uh, difficult situation when they're trying to promote internet freedom and yet um, you know, have to limit their traffic because uh, of just simply the cost of putting up more servers and handling um, demand, particularly in times of surges. Um, in the first panel, we also got a couple of questions about um, uh, China and whether um, there was um, actual um, uh, demand that was being unserved. And so uh, I'd like to turn to Adam and then to Martin and Charlie um, through, uh, through Aram's uh, uh, text channel to talk a little bit about, um, Adam, if you want to talk a little bit about Lantern and then we'll, we'll turn over to Great Fire. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Um, yeah. So Lantern's been operating in, in China for for some time, and that's that's traditionally been our biggest market. I think we're we're larger larger in Iran at this point by user numbers. But uh, you know, I think in our experience, China is really very different from the rest of the world in the sense that their own domestic internet is so developed and so popular that you don't have the same kind of demand that you see in a place like Iran where, you know, Telegram gets blocked. And like Clint was saying in 2018, you see this huge surge in traffic with, it, with this, this rise in protests and things like Instagram and Telegram being blocked at different, different points. In China, you know, the Chinese government is never gonna block WeChat, right? They're never gonna block Baidu. Their, the, their own internet is in many ways more advanced than our own internet. So you have this, very challenging situation going back to some of some of the ideas that Aaron was bringing up where you're, you're trying to sort of carve out this free space in the face of all of these sort of overwhelmingly powerful actors such as the Chinese government or such as these large corporations that have their own different different motivations so to me this issue is really very different in China than it is in the rest of the world where I think in China you're almost forced into this sort of guerrilla warfare style approach where you don't wanna have this pitch battle against this you know, overwhelmingly dominant force. You wanna sort of uh, have a lot of small little skirmishes that you know you can win and sort of wear down the opponent over time. To me, that's sort of clearly the, the path forward in China and this, unfortunately, this notion that there's this, uh, 
latent demand for the free and open internet, I think is largely just a myth in our experience. And I don't, I don't mean to, to, you know, contradict previous speakers, but in our experience that just, that just doesn't sort of match reality on the ground, primarily because you have such a strong and rich internet life domestically and all these companies that offer these, these, these incredible, incredible services elsewhere in the world. I think, I think that's actually more true you know, where you have, you have uh, uh, a lot of people in, in Iran, let's say, who, who can't live on a day-to-day -day basis without whatever messaging app is the popular one at that, at that moment. Um, and, you know, I think in places like Belarus, you see, you see this as well, where, where, you, where you see internet blocking that just fundamentally cripples the country. In China, that's, that's, that's not been our experience at all. Um, so yeah, so I think I think uh, Arms earlier framing I thought you know really resonated with me where where I, we certainly see ourselves as trying to build technology that on a sort of fundamental level carves out this free space for people around the world uh, in spite of these sort of overwhelming odds. But you know I think there are these distinct advantages that we have at a technical level where we can do all of these things that that uh, uh, sort of by virtue of the decentralized nature of the internet give us these these powerful approaches that I think, you know, are still at the same time, very hopeful. Very good. Thanks, Adam. Um, uh, uh, very interesting. And I hope uh, provoke some uh, discussion. Um, we are open for uh, questions. Uh, so if you um, uh, want to go ahead and post them uh, into the into the chat box, that's fine. And um, I'll turn the program over to Aram, who will uh, then patch in um, the uh, comments uh, from uh, our friends at Great Fire. Thanks, Eric. I'll just read um, verbatim what uh, Martin and Charlie sent me. Uh, Great Fire was founded in 2011 with a mission to fight online censorship in China. It is no secret that in that time, the censorship environment in China has only worsened considerably and demand for new and different anti-censorship tools has grown. In that context, Great Fire has evolved to offer a range of tools that run the gamut from checking the accessibility of sites inside China to monitoring what's being censored on Weibo and WeChat to providing ways to circumvent censorship. With AppleCensorship.com, we are also monitoring censorship by Apple in their own app store, as in many cases, it is private sector cooperation that facilitates state-imposed blocks, as we were just talking about in the last panel. Uh, you may recall that it was Apple that removed hundreds of VPN apps from its China App Store in 2017, highlighting the dire and increasing need for viable circumvention tools inside China. Free Browser, Great Fire's primary circumvention tool, is an internet browser with circumvention tech baked in. To give an idea of its popularity, Free Browser was used by more than 140,000 unique users over the last 30 days at a rate of about two or 3,000 per day. These statistics and those for all our projects are accessible on our homepage and are openly available to the public. We also measure how many times we direct our users to news and information sources that are being blocked by the Great Firewall. On Free Browser, we serve up otherwise censored stories right on the app's homepage. In the month of November, those normally censored stories were accessed over 225,000 times by Free Browser users. In the case of Free Browser, over 92% of our users are based in China. This is not altogether surprising given, as our name implies, Great Fire was founded with a mission of fighting China's Great Firewall, specifically, and our tools are marketed with Chinese users at top of mind. However, it is worth noting that the fight for internet freedom is a global one, and our tools are available to users around the world. For instance, Great Fire's newest product, AppMaker, allows anyone to make a censorship resistant Android app in minutes. And this is as viable and needed in China as it is in places like Iran, Russia, or Venezuela. Um, and I believe that that, that can be downloaded from uh, appmaker.greatfire.org. Uh, I'll try to find it. Yeah, appmaker.greatfire.org. Okay, very good. Well, the floor is open for, um, for questions from our uh, participants. Um, I guess I'd like to circle back uh, for a moment to Michael Ho and just say, you know, we've heard a lot about um, 
surges and you know one day it's Azerbaijan and the next day it's Belarus and the next day it's uh, you know another um, uh, another country. Um, when you're trying to manage a global network, um, how do you uh, get the necessary analytics in order to number one know what's going on and to be able to uh, respond to it? And that would include uh, blocking events as well. Uh, well, it's a really interesting question, and you know, it's something that um, uh, you know, the thing about a, any kind of you know serious v, uh, anti censorship tool is. Um, it's very important that we don't know uh, what users uh, are on our network and we don't know what they're doing, so to speak. And so uh, as a result, we've had to um, depend on uh, you know, network analytics as opposed to user analytics. And um, so uh, as a result of that, we, we have a very, we have a large um, uh, uh, repository of our network analytics that are not attributable to any, any individual person, but rather um, just uh, generic bytes transferred or connection capabilities and that kind of thing. And so we have a, a large uh, uh, repository called the Siphon Data Engine, which um, is also available to the public to see at uh, uh, sciex.ca, that's psix.ca, uh, that, that um, shows how, how our tools being used all around the world. Um, uh, so it's really that um, analytics engine that gives us the capability to see which protocols are working and which ones aren't, and then uh, that, that that points to the right places to go and and you know continue with our research and development. And so it's this combination of uh, a, of a you know uh, network analytics uh, along with um, sort of more classic machine learning that gives us the capability to both identify and respond to uh, blocking events. Uh, you know, through, around the world. And I, it, it's very interesting to see how the network looks different uh, if you're looking at it from uh, the, the uh, Chinese users of, uh, point of view or an Iranians or uh, someone in Brazil or uh, Indonesia or, you know, Uganda and that kind of thing. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, very interesting. Um, I'd like to uh, now turn to our other panelists and ask about um, kind of the future of these technology platforms. We've got a mix of established uh, circumvention tools, uh, anti-censorship tools that are used by millions of people. Um, there are some new ideas that are perhaps in the startup phase. There have been some old ideas that have never, um, or at least had a, a bit of trouble in uh, kind of coming into uh, maturity. And I'd just like to, um, open a general question to the panel of where they think the next technological play should be uh, in order to keep the bits and bytes moving. Don't be shy. <laughs> I'm trying to speak to that, Eric. Uh, this is Adam again from, from Lantern. I mean, I think uh, to me, again, I would, I would sort of separate out that question uh, in China versus the rest of the world, where I think in, in, in China, you're really trying to compete with the domestic internet. So, so what can you build that uh, is as compelling a user, offers as compelling a user experience as WeChat? You know, it, to what extent can you create something that is censorship resistant, but still allows people these, this very usable tool to communicate? You know, and I think there's, there's an opportunity uh, with things like that to potentially uh, gain mind share in, in China specifically. You know, elsewhere in the world, I think uh, to me, it's somewhat similar in the sense that I, th I think that the, the challenge is, is just building tools that are compelling enough to users that they want to use them more often. You know, so I think, I think circumvention in and of itself in, in sort of the direction that we're going is maybe not that interesting to to a lot of people. It's it's a it's a means to an end, right? You're trying to get access to X messaging app or trying to get access to Facebook, YouTube, whatever whatever it is. So I guess in uh, in our in our view, trying to offer some of those things directly in a censorship resistant way and in a more privacy preserving way is a compelling approach. Yeah, very good. Um, Bill or Clint, uh, do you have any um, other comments about um, what we've said so far uh, in terms of the future? 
Uh, hi, uh, this is Bill. Uh, I want to add some points since uh, we have lots of interactions with our users and uh, we uh, found one pattern in our users that uh, some of the users are activists. So they will download informations and then they will make flyers and booklets or make DVD and then they will distribute those informations. So uh, uh, this way, the internet combined with those uh, traditional information and, um, distributions. And uh, the Chinese government are well aware of uh, these possibilities. And uh, there are many people um, arrested or uh, arrested uh, every year. And they have some uh, court guideline. If you possess certain number of, uh, numbers of booklets or DVD that the, the government doesn't like, and then uh, they will, uh, th this will be used as a reason to send people to, uh, to prison. So uh, uh, we, uh, we try to work closely uh, with those uh, activists and help them to um, get information for uh, further distribution. So this is uh, one aspect of the uh, usage of uh, our software. And uh, in, in general, uh, in recent years, uh, the, the use of uh, videos, uh, the consumption of video contents has been uh, rising. So uh, uh, as Adam just mentioned, uh, uh, in order to uh, fulfill uh, user needs and compete with what's available uh, in the domestic uh, Chinese internet, uh, we, uh, we, we need to be able to provide a good video experience. Mm, there was one example that uh, in, in the uh, US election nights, there is a traffic burst. And uh, the reason is that uh, instead of um, reading text-based news, and many people are watching those live stream of uh, US election reports, and this caused, uh, caused the uh, traffic burst. And um, another challenge uh, we have is like Xiaoxiang mentioned, the Chinese government has control of every aspect uh, of the Chinese society. And technically, so they are able to, um, to uh, control all those IP, ISPs to set up um, their great firewall. And sometimes they will launch large scale DOS attack to uh, attack either um, Chinese language website outside of China or maybe attack uh, our technologies. So uh, with the collaboration of those ISPs, uh, they, they are able to launch uh, um, sophisticated DOS attack or maybe very large scale DOS attack like uh, hundreds of uh, gigabits per second. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, we do also have a response, um, I believe from uh, Martin. Um, you wanna go ahead and- uh... Sure, uh, yeah, Martin just responded. Um, I agree with Adam about the need to build compelling products that provide more than just circumvention. I think that was in response specifically to Adam distinguishing between, uh, between activists and users and kind of everyday end users who would add to the robustness of networks. Uh, he says, I also think tool promotion and distribution will be an increasing challenge. It doesn't matter how good your tool is if people don't know it and or can't download it and people are unlikely to share tools with friends due to perceived risks. I think that's all true. And I'd actually like to add a tag onto this question if you don't mind, Eric. No, actually go right ahead. What we can do uh, now, uh, Aram, is we've got two more questions in the, um, in the chat box. One on uh, educating the public and two, um, you know, do these, um, tools like the Facebook Oversight Board, um, are these positive or negative developments? And so maybe you could answer that and pick up that tag 
And then let's go ahead and um, uh, close out the session with some general remarks um, that you can make. And then um, I'll come back uh, after that. Sure. Uh, let me start with a brief observation, which is that this conversation has been remarkably free of discussion of platforms that are independent of the internet. I'm thinking about stuff like mesh networking, uh, of which you know there's been uh, many efforts, some failures, and some successes over the last 15 years. Uh, but also, you know, uh, digital dead drops, um, systems like uh, El Paquete, uh, which uh, they've had in Cuba for many years. Um, there was even uh, a, a threat, and it wasn't clear how serious this was. That I think it was the Pirate Bay was going to launch uh, low orbit satellites and create a, a stable network um, beyond the bounds of. Uh, of uh, internet regulation. Um, so has the internet freedom community just kind of given up on the, uh, is the internet so totalistic at this point that internet freedom platforms can only be, con be conceived of as, um, as accessories to the internet writ large? Is the, is the idea of building a separate network fruitless at this point? That's, that's my add-on question to what you guys were just sharing. Um, as, as in answer to the questions on the Q&A, um, I think educating the general public is a huge part of what we do at universities. Eric and I uh, have both, uh, along with our colleagues at AU, hosted dozens of internet freedom and related events per year for as long as we both worked there. Um, but it does need to be integrated more, I think, into our, our, our civic vision, uh, both in America and elsewhere in the world. This notion that, that being, uh, you know, participating in the democratic process uh, means standing up for internet freedom. Uh, and as to the Facebook oversight board, that's a, that's a can of worms. We don't, I, I don't have time to open at the moment because there's a lot to be said. Yeah, I think the same goes for section 230 um, of, of the Communications Decency Act. These are, you know, domestic issues in the United States, but, you know, obviously have global um, uh, ramifications. Um, we are just coming up on the uh, end of our event. I am sure that um, uh, my uh, uh, two um, associates, Kate Arian and Matt uh, Siklecki, um, are very grateful that we're coming up on four o'clock and we're right on time. I uh, just wanted uh, a shout out to those two who, uh, as part of the uh, AU communications team, have really done a terrific job at putting this event together. Uh, I'd also like to thank our uh, other co-sponsors, um, the uh, three American university institutions, uh, the Internet Society of the Greater Washington Area, and the Voices of Internet Freedom Coalition. Um, we could not have done this without you. Um, I also want to say that um, we would like to carry on this conversation. And so we are planning a follow-up event for late January and here we want to talk about the supply side of internet freedom. We're going to look at the federal 2021 budget and that promised $68 million top line that the um, uh, State Department and other agencies seem to be uh, pushing toward and where that money is going to go and what priorities should, um, should be first in line. So, um, Thanks everyone for um, uh, attending and thanks to all our panelists. Uh, you folks did a great job and we really appreciate it. Um, Aram, any uh, final words and then we'll call it an afternoon. Uh, well, I'll, I'll just tag on to the tag I already made, which is to say, I, I think for me, the big takeaway from this is that um, we are long past the point where the term internet freedom uh, can be distinguished from the concept of freedom writ large in the political sense. Uh, the internet is so integral to our civic processes, to our political processes, to our social institutions, that um, we can't talk about democracy or freedom or autonomy or sovereignty without considering the role of digital communication networks in those processes. And we can't talk about the governance of the internet and other digital communications networks without considering their civic and political consequences. And so from here on in, you know, I propose we just get rid of the internet and just call it freedom.
Okay, well, that's a tall order, Aaron. Maybe we'll pick that one up next month uh, in, our, in our next panel. Um, uh, and um, it's really been a pleasure to be here with, with all of you and uh, the conversation continues. So thanks very much, everyone. Have enjoy the rest of your evening or morning or wherever you are. And we hope to see you next month.